Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to conservation and careful management of the state's forests to make them more resilient and better habitats for wildlife. Choosewood.com. From St. Louis Public Radio. This is St. Louis on the Air. It's interesting to think of. It, it sounds like there's numerous references in these letters. I imagine you were familiar with these letters before. You just didn't understand that Eliza was there Correct. against her will. Exactly, yeah. Um, uh, we just thought Eliza was a servant girl. When we began to look around a little bit more, when we knew for certain there was an enslaved woman here, uh, the documents we already had began to make a lot more sense, and we began to see this name Eliza pop up in correspondence. They were just in the shadows. It's a, a servant's story and the Campbell story kind of mixing. I'm Sarah Fenske. Since 1851, Campbell House has proudly stood in what's now downtown West St. Louis. Today, it's the only remaining home in what was known as Lucas Place, an exclusive enclave then on the outskirts of town. The home has a long and storied history. It's been a museum since 1943. But it's only now giving up what might be its ugliest secret. That secret is the focus of the new exhibit at Campbell House Museum. It's called The Back of the House, Servants and Slavery at Campbell House. And joining us now to tell us more is the museum's executive director, Andy Hahn. Andy, welcome. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. So you've been at Campbell House Museum 19 years, and you've said you didn't know for the first decade that the house had ever been home to an enslaved person. How did that history end up coming to light? Well, about 12 years ago, we received a grant from the Missouri Humanities Council to help us develop a new education curriculum. And at that time, allowed us to do uh, some more research that we just didn't have the funds to do, for one. Uh, and uh, we really concentrated on trying to figure out stories that we didn't know a lot about. And the line in the building's past for most of it is that Robert Campbell didn't participate in slavery because there were no obvious records that indicated that. But uh, lo and behold, when you start to dig, uh, a lot of things come to light. So what was the key to confirming that, that this had been a very real thing in this house? Well, it really comes down to the census. And listeners might say, well, that's pretty obvious. But this is not the federal census. Hmm. Um, for a period of about 20 years, the city of St. Louis took its own census uh, that stood apart from the federal documents. And and. The United States Census never indicates the Campbells were slave owners, but the city census did, and mm -hmm. that began to make us look a little deeper. Yeah, so you looked deeper at this. Were you able to find out much about the people who'd been enslaved by this family? A whole lot. <laughs> a whole lot, yeah. I mean, to the point you now have a whole exhibit. Yeah, and, and names and stories and descendants of some of these people. So uh, it is a complex story. There was only ever one woman enslaved at the Campbell House, and her name was Eliza. And when we began to look around a little bit more, when we knew for certain there was an enslaved woman here, uh, the documents we already had began to make a lot more sense. And we began to see this name Eliza pop up in correspondence. Uh, and it's from there that her story kind of comes to life. So before we get too deep into Eliza's story, um, Robert and Virginia Campbell, they are the Campbells in Campbell House Museum. Correct. They were not the first owners of this house, but they moved in pretty quick. Yeah, the house was only three years old when they moved in. So it was still and would have been considered a new house in a very up and coming, sparsely developed uh, neighborhood, as you mentioned, on the, the west end of the city. Just so far away right. from the city. Barely yeah. within the city limits, I might add. So. Yeah. So who were these people, Robert and Virginia? Well, Robert was an Irish immigrant uh, who came to St. Louis about 200 years ago and really started his career in business in the fur trade, essentially as a teenager, a 19-year-old. And and that's what he's most well known and remembered as, as someone who went west to the Rocky Mountains, blazed big parts of the Oregon Trail, 
went into partnership with another St. Louisan named Bill Sublet and and made a, a terrific career that uh, brought him a lot of wealth as and, well. And do we know anything about his feelings about the issue of slavery beyond this this individual? Very thing? little. He uh, didn't write. He wrote a lot, I should say, but he doesn't really ever talk about um, uh, his personal views very often. And we ascribe that to the fact that he was a successful businessman. And, you know, successful businessmen have to, you know, stride the middle road to not accept, upset people on either side of an issue. Now, his wife and mother in law tell us a lot more. How so? Well, Mrs. Campbell was a Southerner, she was born and raised in North Carolina and her father was a slave owner. Her mother came from an old Quaker family in Virginia. So mm. her, in her own family, she saw this tension of, you know, owning people and then her mother coming from a background where that was uh, uh, not only actively frowned upon, but but they were the most outspoken of the earliest abolitionists. Yeah. And so then this Virginia ends up marrying Robert. Correct. They move into this house in St. Louis. I understand that Eliza, who we'll get into here in a minute, she's not the only enslaved person that this family owned. Robert Campbell had, had others? Well, we think the story of slavery with the Campbells actually begins with Virginia. And, uh, and her father's estate. When her father dies, she inherits three people um, from his estate. And that's the first kind of known record that we have with Robert uh, having any involvement in slavery. So even though Virginia's mother was a Quaker and, mm -hmm. and very much against slavery, she inherited. It's just it's, it's almost shocking to say she inherited three people. She, Virginia inherited three people. Yeah. Her mother inherited three other people. Her mother chose to emancipate those people. Robert of Virginia did not. The three that Virginia inherited, the three, uh, they were young people, they were children. And they are brought here um, to St. Louis, where they, in not too long a time, kind of disappear from the picture. We don't really know what happened to them. Okay. So our sense is that they did not end up making this move to, to Campbell House by the time the family's at that point. Okay. No, no. We think at least one, if not multiple of them, died in an epidemic of cholera that happened in St. Louis. Okay. So that brings us to Eliza, Eliza County. Correct. Uh, what's her it's name? Her do, maiden name. Her maiden name. Yeah. Do we know how she came into the picture? We don't. She is from uh, Virginia. And she is from a small town where Mrs. Campbell, Virginia Campbell, had two uncles who lived and had a, a prominent business. Hmm. We don't think that's a coincidence, but again, that's just guesswork. So we think somehow she came into Robert of Virginia's possession through Virginia's family in, in Virginia. And do we have a sense of, of how old she was? And you Probably know, a teenager. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And that would have been the 16 case? 16 or 17. Around the time that they moved into this house? No, and... actually before that. Okay. Yeah, um, probably a good five uh, or maybe even seven years before that. By the late 1840s, there's, they, we begin to see references to an Eliza in, in letters. Uh, and it, and the way she's described it, it is, we think it is Eliza uh, Roan. And so do we know what she did for the family? Well, the uh, before her emancipation, it would seem that she was the nanny because mm -hmm. um, uh, Virginia writes quite uh, frequently about Eliza and her help and all of the energy that she has to chase around all of these children. And, and there, was, there was 13 in total, not at any one time, but there was always a lot of children around. So uh, she was – I think Virginia was thankful um, – for the help. It's interesting to think of. It, it sounds like there's numerous references in these letters. I imagine you were familiar with these letters before. You just didn't understand that Eliza was there Correct. against her will. Exactly. Yeah. Um, uh, we just thought Eliza was a servant girl. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, when you start to put pieces together, things make more sense. So what happened to Eliza? Well, in January of 1857, she's emancipated. Uh, and this is before the Civil War. This is before the Civil War. And we don't know what led to that emancipation. Why then? She was 25 years old. She had two children of her own. She had gotten married before her emancipation. Um, uh, but we know that Mrs. Campbell's mother, the Quaker, 
um, moved into the Campbell House um, uh, not too long before this. And we think that may have had an influence on Eliza's emancipation. Interesting. So the mother-in-law comes to the Campbell House. To live. Yeah. And we know that she's vociferously against Correct. slavery. Yeah, yeah. And then this happens in pretty short order. Exactly. It seems like some clues are there. Yes, for sure. So she gets emancipated. Missouri at that time is still a slave state. Correct. And will be, slavery will be legal in Missouri for almost eight more years. Yeah. So this must have been kind of a difficult road for Eliza. Do we know where she went after this? Well, the short of it is, is we don't think her life changed very much. Um, she continued to be now in the employ of the Campbells. Um, uh, it doesn't seem as much as the nanny anymore, but she helped with the, the laundry. Um, uh, uh, but we know she stays connected to uh, not only Robert of Virginia, but their children for the rest of her life. And she doesn't die until the 1920s. And is the belief that she probably continued to live in the house? That's unclear. Um, you know, she she had started a family and that family continued um, to grow. Um, certainly, we think by the time of the Civil War, she was not living there anymore. Interesting. So there's this whole history. It was kind of hiding in plain sight. Why do you think this ended up being something that, you know, by the time we get to Campbell House becoming a museum, mm -hmm. you know, 1940s, 1950s, this was something that wasn't part of the, the oral histories that were passed down? Well, I think the the short of it is is those were not stories that anyone at that time was interested in. Yeah. Uh, not just the story of Eliza, but the story of any of the people that lived and worked behind the scenes. You know, the paid domestics, the maids, the cook, all these people. They were just in the shadows. Um, uh, when they were waiting to come out, and, and not only has Eliza's story come out, but the story of dozens of other paid domestics um, have come out and and shows like uh, Downton Abbey and, and upstairs downstairs exactly <laughs> I'm dating you know, myself here <laughs> <laughs> they make these stories all the more interesting and people want to know well did these stories happen in our in our own town and of course they did yeah I mean I think it, it does seem like such a no-brainer to us to want to answer this question but maybe at the time in the 1940s 1950s they more wanted to admire the the elegant furnishings exactly there was a lot more um, nostalgia about the past and, you know, all that behind the scenes, I don't think played into that nostalgia at that time, at least. So this exhibit, you're really going in depth, as you say, not just Eliza's story, but also talking about the servants who Correct. lived and worked within this house. Do we know much about them? Uh, some we know a lot about. I mean, we've identified by name almost 40 hmm. individuals. Wow. Who Now, they ne never all at one time. You know, they lived in the building continuously for, you know, more than 80 years. Um, uh, and there's kind of certain periods where we know more, you know, censuses tell us information, and then there's gaps um, as well. But thankfully, the descendants of many of these people over the last decade have come forward and shared photographs and stories with us about their ancestors' time uh, working in the house. We're talking today to Andy Hahn. He's the executive director of Campbell House Museum. Its new exhibit is The Back of the House, Servants and Slavery at Campbell House. Um, you know, so many of us looking at these big, old St. Louis houses, we're thinking, wow, what a nightmare to keep something like that cleaned and well-maintained. It takes a village. Um, these servants that were living here, you mentioned just how many you were aware of over time. In sort of the house's heyday, do we have a sense of how many at one point in time uh, were required to just keep things going? Like probably like eight or ten. Eight or ten, okay. And, people, and they were living on site. Exactly. They not only worked there, but they lived on site, which is one people, one reason why these wealthy people needed big houses, because there had to be a place for all these employees to sleep. Yeah. And so you've been able to get actual, um, you know, history from people who heard their stories. Yeah. Um, in, in a couple instances, we actually have oral histories from the people themselves much later in their lives that they had the foresight to, to write down or that they communicated to their son or daughter. And most excitingly for us, those come sometimes come with photographs. Uh, and that's what's really featured uh, in large part in the exhibit is these photographs that have been handed down of servants, not just of them, but them at the Campbell House, of them in the yard of their bedroom, mm -hmm. um, and some artifacts that they uh, were given or uh, uh, took away with them when they left service. And how are you able to acquire it, these kind of histories? It seems like people might not even realize that this is something you'd be interested in. Word, word gets out? Well, the internet, uh, to be frank about it, uh, you put something out there, uh, whether it's on our own website or on Facebook. And uh, just about five years ago, we were contacted by a woman 
who was the granddaughter of a servant, and we had posted her grandmother's name, and she was doing a search, and that name came up in a search. It was an unusual name, so that helps. And she contacted us wildly excited that someone knew her grandma's story and connected us with her mother, the servant's daughter, who uh, in uh, her own way had this huge collection of documents that we were, uh, that they gave us. How cool. So almost the more you put out there, the more that just keeps coming in. Exactly. So for Eliza County, a uh, married name Roan, yes. do we know if any of her descendants are now aware of just everything you've uncovered? They are. So she, uh, after the Civil War, her family moved to Kansas City and uh uh, many of her descendants remain there today. So we've been in communication um, with them. We haven't had the privilege of having any of them come to visit um, us yet. There aren't any in the St. Louis area, but we hope that will happen. In so the they future. now they now know everything you know. Yes, many of them do. Yeah, and and you know it, it's rare to know the history of an enslaved person, and and the fact that we even know Eliza's maiden name mm-hmm. is exceptionally um, rare. So uh, they're pretty excited to to know part of this history. Well, this new exhibit, this just sounds amazing. Um, so beyond the documents that we've talked about, mm-hmm. you know, these letters, things like this, what else are you able to show to the public who want to come to Campbell House Museum and, and see all this for themselves? Uh, well, perhaps the the biggest and splashiest item is a shirt. A shirt. A shirt. It is a white dress shirt. Um, it actually belonged to a member of the Campbell family. We know that because it has his initials embroidered into it. But it came to us because the cook, when she left service, took some of these shirts with us, with her. And they sat in her hope chest for um, over 80 years. And her daughter had these shirts and thought they came from the Campbell House. And when she brought them in and we could identify them by the initials. And, and so that's probably the splashiest, biggest exhibit. So it's a, it's a perfect mix of a servant's story and the Campbell story kind of mixing through yeah. an object. So even though we don't get to see the shirt that the servant would have worn, the, the shirt that she took with her when she left employment. Yeah. And she, clearly that it had a resonance to her, why she why she saved it all of those years and it just sat there. Um, we we don't know, but yeah. we're grateful for it. And so for Eliza, who you know is, is finally sort of getting her due, mm-hmm. and, and her story's being explored here, do we have anything that that would have belonged to her? I know that's a huge ask. <laughs> well, no, no objects outside of of documents in the exhibit are two really telling documents from a, a big time difference. One is a in 1861. It's her freedom bond mm-hmm. as a free person of color in Missouri, she was required to have a bond taken out in her name to guarantee her good conduct. And her former owner, Robert Campbell, did that. It was a $500 bond. And you have to fast forward all the way to 1918. We have a letter in Eliza's hand that's written to the last two Campbells who are living in the house, just kind of checking in with them and saying, I haven't heard from you in a while. I hope you are both well. Hmm. I want to hear from you. And, And those two old Campbell brothers she had helped raise them, and at least with one of them had probably been in the room when they were born. So it's a very complex relationship. Yeah, and it sounds like they maintained these these friendly relations yes, they did. for decades. They did. Wow. Well, this is just a, a remarkable story. I want to encourage people, you can see this for yourself. Uh, the back of the house, Servants and Slavery at Campbell House, is on display now through the end of the year. Uh, the Campbell House Museum is open Sunday through Thursday. It's also open by appointment on Monday and Tuesday. You can find more details at campbellhousemuseum.org. We also have a link on our website. That's stlonair.show. You can learn more about Eliza Roan, um, her life, all these details that we're now finally learning about this woman who lived here in St. Louis. Andy Hahn, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. This episode was produced by Alex Hoyer with audio engineering by Aaron Doerr. Our production intern is Avery Rogers. This podcast was mixed and edited by Aaron. Our executive producer is Alex Hoyer. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio. Understanding starts here. Do you find yourself regularly listening to episodes of St. Louis on the Air? 
suggest us to a friend you think might enjoy our conversations. And leave us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the simplest way to help people discover our show. Thanks. St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to conservation and careful management of the state's forests to make them more resilient and better habitats for wildlife. Choosewood.com.